Hello, and welcome to Next Generation Behavioral Health. 10-minute tips for modernizing patient care. I'm Dr. Christina Armstrong. And I'm Dr. Julie Kinn. We work in the Department of Defense to develop mobile apps, websites, and other health technology, and to share it with providers and beneficiaries. That's right. We travel around the country and sometimes out of the country training military providers on the core competency of the integration of these technologies into clinical care. And as we travel around, we found that we hear a lot of the same questions over and over again. And we wanted to begin to share the answers with all of you out there. That's right. And we do it in 10 minutes or you get your money back. And that's going to be really challenging on this topic because I know we both have a lot to say on it. And also we get tons of questions about it. And it's social media, how to use social media safely and how to set a social media policy. Absolutely. What do we mean by social media? Good question. You know, when I think of social media, of course, the first things that come to mind are those social networking sites like LinkedIn, Facebook, and all those types of sites. What do you think? It's different from just email or going to a website because social media indicates that you're sharing some sort of personally identifiable information. If your PII is out there, if people can trace your comment on that cooking blog back to you, that's social Mm -hmm. media and your patients might be seeing that. So you should expect that all of your patients are going to Google you. (laughs) It's just, that's that's, that's what they do. So I would Google yourself if you have never done that and look Look at all the interesting things up there about you. If you do have a unique name, unfortunately, any comment that you've made on a public website could appear mm-hmm. there. Absolutely. And you know, fun fact for all of you, um, <laughs> it, I thought this was very, this was a surprise for me. So what we found in the research is that although, so at least our patients in the military, they tend to be younger, 30 or below. Right. And of course, all of us clinicians tend to be older than that, like 35 and above. So you would imagine that our social media use would be different, right? That probably the younger folks were, you know, all hip to this stuff and they're using it more. But we found that that's not the case. The providers are actually using it at the same level as the service members. I was so surprised when I first saw that too. It was not my first expectation, but it's different sites, right? So our right. younger folks are using Instagram and Twitter and Musical.ly and the older folks us. We're using <laughs> Facebook. I, I hope you don't mind, Dr. Armstrong, if I oh, classify not at you all. in there. <laughs> I am in that group. <laughs> we, we use Facebook and we use Twitter and Instagram too, but but it, uh-huh. it is different, but we're still using it. I, I don't know about you, Great. but my parents are on social media. Are yours? Absolutely. My my kid's great grandma is on oh um, social media and she is wonderful at it. So it's interesting. So for you know providers out there, it's important to note that you and your colleagues are on social media and that what we know is that your patients are going to look you up yeah. for, uh, for two reasons. Sometimes they will look you up out of curiosity. And so there's some potential ethical issues in there. There's also, they'll look you up for the reason that we look up any kind of businesses that we want to do business with. We want to check out reviews. And that's, of course, we want to know before we see a doctor, what are they like? Are they bad? Are they good? And that's an honest reason for, for doing that. So the question is, how can providers prevent and manage risks? The ethical dilemmas that result when someone might see pictures of your kids online and Mm -hmm. then comment on a picture you posted on Facebook. All of a sudden, you're in kind of a multiple relationship there. That that gets pretty tricky. Uh, Have you ever had an intrusive client or patient using social media to contact you? Yes, I have. And you don't need to tell us about the specifics. I won't. But you know, it it did when 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 it happened. I I realized at the time it was kind of early in my kind of use of social media, so it came about unexpectedly. I wasn't anticipating it, but now of course I'm more proactive in my approach. But what it brought up for me is immediately there was those issues of multiple relationships, potential boundary crossing, and it and. And also confidentiality of my patient as well. There's parts of their personal life that I I want them to be able to keep 
their own and only share with me if they want to. Yeah, you don't want them to to write on your Facebook page, Dr. Armstrong is the best clinician ever. She helped me (laughs) following this disorder because all of a sudden they have revealed way too much about themselves. At least in Facebook and LinkedIn and all those social media sites, there are ways to protect your privacy in the settings features. So that's, I urge everybody, um, all providers to become familiar with that. Even if you're not so technologically savvy, I urge you to click the settings button and start to explore. And I know at least for Facebook, they guide users through this is how you can protect it. And they really kind of spell, spell it out for you. I'd also add to do that quarterly, like put a reminder on your calendar that, okay, it's been three months. I'm just going to go to Facebook and check to make sure my security settings are where I want them. Because Facebook does add new security settings all the time. And I'm saying Facebook, all these sites do. Uh, and, And it's worth a quarterly check to make sure that you've set it the exact way you want it. So for example, a lot of these sites, it allows easy access to your personal email, your phone and your address. So although I've never had a situation where I was personally in in danger because of a patient, at least not in my personal home, there could be be potential for that out there. And so you do want to be thoughtful and proactive in protecting your privacy. What I like to do and what I we recommend when we're training providers is have this conversation immediately. When you're talking about what is treatment, what does it look like? One of the things we always talk about is if you leave me a message, it's going to be this many hours before I listen to it, right? That's just general mm-hmm. safety. Same thing with social media. I say, you know, in my personal life, I do use social media but I don't respond to friend requests. And then the patient or client always says, oh, no, 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 I would never send you a friend request, even though I got them all the time before I started saying that. And I think it just doesn't occur to them, especially if this is their first experience in behavioral health care, they might not know. And if you've got this great rapport and they start thinking of you as someone who cares for them, they might want to send you a friend request on Facebook so you can see the picture of their kids doing the thing they told you about. So just... Stop it before it starts so it doesn't feel rejecting later because we want to avoid that. We don't want them to feel bad. And I would put it in my consent forms, but Mm -hmm. also just really clearly spell it out in a kind way. I completely agree. I hear you saying two things. So one is having a written informed consent that describes your social media policy. And then I hear you saying having that active conversation describing potential risks and how you're going to approach it. What I really love about that is it really mirrors how, even before social media was around, how we used to approach these potential boundary crossings. I'll give you an example. So before social media existed, one of the first conversations I would have with the patient when we were going through the informed consent is at the time I was practicing in a very close community. Oh, and I right. knew I was going to see patients. That yes. I, I would probably see them in the grocery store. Right. And so I would have the conversation, hey, you know, you're probably going to see me around. That's okay. But to protect your privacy, I will not approach you at the grocery store or anywhere if I see you. Um, just to kind of set up those boundaries right yeah. up front, because I know that those are going to happen. And right. so the same exact thing for the casual nature of social media to kind of set it up front in writing and verbally, then there's no hard feelings. Exactly. We don't we don't want to wound them. Right. Fortunately, we can avoid that grocery store situation Christy was talking about before because now we buy everything online and don't have to interact <laughs> with humans at all. <laughs> well, isn't this isn't that ideal? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so today we talked about how to develop a social media policy for you and for your practice, and also how to communicate that social media policy with your patient. Yeah, let us know what you think. And if you have any other suggestions that would be useful for, for our listeners. Thanks for joining us today on Next Generation Behavioral Health. Please connect with us on Facebook and Twitter at Military Health and check out our other podcasts, mobile apps, and websites. They're all free for the military community but are useful for civilians too. Thank you so much for subscribing on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts and for leaving us ratings. Next Generation Behavioral Health is produced by the Defense Health Agency.